All right. Well, it's great to uh, to talk to you all here, and um, um, I I just prepared some kind of general comments. Um, so I'm a, an associate professor in psychology in the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition, and um, so I publish uh, both in psychology, neuroscience, um, and in medicine. Um, maybe I will put this here. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? So um, I can speak both about my experiences in terms of being a PLOS One editor. Um, I'm happy to, to answer questions people might have about the, the PLOS journals or about, um, and maybe I'll say a couple things about kind of the behind the scenes of the editorial process because I think that's maybe one of the advantages to some of these open access journals. But I think to sort of frame the broader discussion, I, I think we're in an interesting space right now in time where we're seeing a sea change in terms of um, how we go about publishing uh, our research. Um, lots of journals, there's, there's all sorts of new open access journals that are coming out that are solely open access. But what we're also seeing is lots of journals now that are um, offering an opportunity, so existing journals that we publish in that are, that are offering opportunities to pay a fee for our articles and to have that then be immediately open access uh, online. So um, uh, I think we're going to see how this shakes out. I imagine if we did this again next year, we're going to have a very different conversation about the kind of evolving nature of, um, of, of how open access is going to inform um, our, it's sort of, I think, becoming increasingly a reality for, for how we're going to go about um, publishing our work. Um, but uh, as it currently stands, we have a number of, of uh, really, I think, hundreds of open access journals that are out there now. Um, uh, one thing you do need to think about, I think, is um, uh, which open access journals you're sending your work to. There's been a lot of kind of concern um, and, and some media that's come out lately about how there's sort of um, uh, discredited uh, journals in sort of obscure places in the world that are um, basically encouraging people to submit their science and pay outrageous fees to, uh, to submit that science there when in fact these are not really uh, uh, well-recognized journals with uh, uh, rigorous peer review uh, standards. Um, so uh, my, I think my recommendation generally to folks is if you're thinking about open access, talk to people in your field about um, what open access journals people are looking at. Um, two of the, the ones that, that, that we look at a lot are the PLOS journals uh, and also the Frontiers journals. Um, and I think those are sort of making their way into all sorts of sub-disciplines. Um, in terms of PLOS One, this is a, a general science journal. Um, uh, we were just talking about it. It seemed to have a fairly high impact factor. Um, and I've, I've now published two papers there, and I serve uh, on the editorial um, uh, uh, board there. And um, I think that uh, there are some real advantages that I see, uh, particularly with, with the PLOS journals. Um, and, and more generally, I think this is true of the, uh, these uh, open access journals. And that's that there's a very quick peer review process in terms of um, the actual review of your manuscripts. And there's a very, very quick turnaround, moving that paper from uh, an accepted uh, uh, paper into kind of a copy edited final proof and that's then appearing immediately online. So um, if you're, uh, you know, you have students or you're, you or yourself are really interested in getting this work out quickly, these, uh, these uh, online uh, types of journals can be very effective um, for getting your work out. Um, as far as behind the scenes go, the, the editorial process, at least at, at PLOS One, has been a, a really nice process. We still, um, th there's kind of a, in this debate about um, publishing in, in um, um, kind of open access journals, you know, people sometimes label it as sort of pay to play type of journals, and it's sort of put in more of a kind of a stigmatized category. Um, and, and I think the top open access journals, there's the, just an equivalent type of peer review process. Um, uh, the one advantage to open access journals is typically we require our um, reviewers to turn around manuscripts in 10 days or less, um, which is in contrast, at least in psychology and classic social psychology journals, you can um, be waiting for four to six months for, uh, for the reviews to come in. So uh, there's kind of that, that much faster turnaround. But still, um, the, the same types of peer review standards are held at PLOS One. Uh, in terms of getting uh, multiple uh, and well-known um, peers to, to review the work. Um, so overall, I think it's a really exciting time. We're seeing a real shift in the kind of landscape for how we publish our scientific research. And I think that there's some real advantages to these, these open access journals. I don't know if people had a chance to look going on to uh, you know, a place like PLOS One or Frontiers. They're all about sort of putting up metrics for um, kind of determining your impact. 
everything from people kind of posting this on their Twitter feeds to Facebook posts. Um, and, uh, and so you can track not only the social media, but also the number of people who are downloading as well as sort of bookmarking and, and citing your work, um, which I think is exciting and can be a, kind of a fun way to track the impact of your work. And I guess the last thing I'll say about open access, which is kind of the most fundamental piece of this, and that's that um, it provides an opportunity for the whole world to have access to this work immediately. Um, we're sort of in a very privileged place being here in the United States at an elite institution. We sort of take for granted the fact that we can get most journal articles that we're interested in, when in fact the rest of the world doesn't have that type of luxury. Um, and so you can see your work quickly get into the hands of people who are going to be um, policymakers in other countries to, um, to people who, who, uh, who need this work and can translate it into um, you know, their daily lives, health and well-being. So, um, that open access, I, I've really found, makes a, a huge difference in terms of just your overall impact. So with that, I, I have to, I'm sorry I can't stay longer. This is, I think, an important discussion. I, I, I know um, my colleague Mike Tarr is going to talk about his own views on... Oh, you have to leave early, too. Um, but can I answer any questions? Maybe it might be most helpful for me to answer questions related to, um, to the PLOS journals. PLOS One is just one of a, a couple of journals that, that, the, that PLOS stands for Public Library of Science. Um, and uh, how many articles are you saying are coming out? 30,000 this year in PLOS One. So they're, you know, they're really trying to get a lot of, um, uh, the, the criteria at PLOS One, by the way, change a little bit. Um, it's not about um, the kind of perceived impact of the work um, at PLOS One. It's really about the quality of the work. So there's always some concern during, you know, um, editorial review processes. Um, you know, is this work that we're reviewing, is it good enough for science? You know, or is it good enough for nature neuroscience? Those criteria are downgraded at PLOS. The goal is really to get the work out there and to make sure that it's quality reporting and, um, and quality science as opposed to perceived impact. Okay, yeah. How many referees are you using for each article and are you doing double blind? Yeah, so um, I'm, not do, I'm not doing double blind. Um, it's, it's, uh, uh, our field has never used double blind. Yeah, our, our field has never used double blind uh, criteria. Oh, there's a couple journals in our field that use double blind. but. Um, uh, no, we, we, we use basically a single blind approach such that um, uh, the, the author of the article isn't knowing who the reviewers are, um, but the reviewers do know who the authors are. Um, it's sort of hard in our field to kind of get away with a good, true double blind. You can usually figure out who it is pretty quickly. So that was your first question. Oh, how many re referees? Um, it ranges at PLOS. Um, the minimum is usually two plus an editor. I've been really impressed with the PLOS um, uh, administrative staff. They always make sure on my papers to um, um, reach out to get a statistical consultant. So um, uh, they've been really good about um, saying, hey, David, do you want to also have a statistical consultant on this? We'll get someone for you. So um, uh, you know, on average, with the papers that I review, I usually get two reviewers, a statistical person, and then I like to read the article. So I really think of that as three and a half um, uh, reviews. It, de it ranges, though. Um, I've, seen, I've seen four, and I've seen two at times. Yeah? What do you feel was the, the, the reason behind the, the avoiding the, the sting that the science did recently? It's one of the ones that successfully turned the article away. Yeah, so are you going to talk about the sting? Yeah, so <laughs> let's save that for the next presenter, because um, um, Mike Tarr, maybe it's time to turn it over, and you can um, say a little bit about your impressions of the, uh, the sting and the debate. I know you're critical. But anyway, thanks for having me, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have this again in the next year or two, and it'll probably